Welcome to Guitar Gavel, a place for people who love guitars. These are conversations with musicians, guitar enthusiasts, techs, and collectors about their guitar journey and their love of the instrument. Thanks for tuning in. Please hit the subscribe button, share with your friends, and be sure to sign up for our twice weekly newsletter at guitargavel.com. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Guitar Gavel Podcast. I'm your host, David Still. Thanks so much for joining us. Listen, I want to say thank you very much for your time, first and foremost. If you enjoy the show, if you're a, a longtime listener and haven't subscribed, hit the subscribe button, please. If it's your first time, do the same. Leave a comment. Give me a five, give us a five star review. Love to hear some feedback. But most importantly, want to say thank you for your time. And I am pumped to have this guest with you here today, tonight. In our case, it's tonight. David Ross with David Ross Musical Instruments, a guitar tech, a guitar player, and an up and coming pedal builder. So we're going to talk about all of the above. We're going to hear a little bit about the, the guitar tech business. We're going to talk about his guitar journey. And we're going to take a look at his latest pedal that is uh, on the build block and uh, learn all about that. So David, thank you very, very much for being here. Thanks for being a guest. Look forward to our conversation for the next little while. Definitely. Thank you for having me. Hey, man. My pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, for for long time, viewers and listeners of the show, you know, I kind of jump in with the same question, right? So we, we, we typically talk about guitar journeys. We'll deviate a little bit here and there. We'll, we'll hear your story, of course. And generally, it all starts with, when did you start playing? And tell us about that first guitar, man. Sure. Um, I started playing guitar when I was about 13 years old. Um, I should kind of preface by saying that I played a number of other instruments kind of as a kid. Um, I played recorder. That was probably the best intru instrument that I uh, played because I had kind of consistent lessons in school. Um, I tried a bunch of other instruments, piano, drums, but nothing really stuck. And um, I think that like I was always musically inclined. Um, my father is actually a professional musician. Uh, he plays avant-garde jazz. And um, it was around 13 years old that I actually started playing guitar with him. Um, he is, in addition to being a performer, he's also a music teacher. And uh, so he started teaching me how to play guitar. And um, yeah, my first uh, guitar was actually a Behringer Stratocaster. It was like a hundred dollars with a with an amp, and uh, it was a pretty good guitar. I I played that for uh, quite a long time. Um, eventually, I got to the point where I was kind of repairing and modding guitars, and that kind of had to be sacrificed uh, that guitar. <laughs> but uh, you know, all in the name of progress. And uh, so yeah, that was that was pretty much uh, when it started, and that was the guitar that I had. What kind of music were you into when you first started playing? Um, I would say that around 13 years old, um, I was starting to get into like heavier music, like uh, more rock based, but like I wanted heavier music. So it was kind of the beginning of my metal journey. So I was listening to bands like Metallica, you know, Ozzy Osbourne, that type of thing. Um, that was really kind of the that was really kind of where I was at at that age. Also, um, I also kind of played blues uh, with my father. He, you know, was teaching me kind of scales, chords, and also kind of blues. So that was kind of the foundation that I had. Um, I was personally interested more in metal, but um, foundationally in terms of my guitar playing, it was a lot of uh, blues guitar, which was actually a, a huge benefit to me kind of moving forward. The two genres are really, they're kind of coupled together. What, so your dad being a professional player, what, uh, how did that play into the, to the scheme of your learning? And did he, would, I mean, how did he treat you when you're like, you know, I want to play the guitar? Well, um, it was actually kind of him uh, and my mother more, just kind of like buying me this this guitar and saying like hey like you should you should play guitar and you know they they kind of gifted it to me and i i just kind of went along with it and um yeah that that was really uh that was pretty much how it started um 
so yeah, yeah, just playing that that guitar. And did you did your dad teach you a lot, or did was he very hands off? Uh, he was, you know, he would kind of bring me over to a studio and we would play, and you know, I I would kind of learn, um, you know, what he was teaching. Um, but he kind of left me to my own devices largely. Um, you know, I, I would learn kind of what he what he set out, but I think eventually, like really what the tipping point with me was, was when I realized that I could play music that I was personally interested in. And so that really kind of launched me into playing guitar long term. So like he would teach me um, kind of blues and then kind of leave me to my own devices as far as everything else. And uh, I think that was like, that was a good way to go. Like it's, it's one thing to just take lessons but it's another thing to kind of actively pursue your own thing outside of lessons. So. Sure. What, um, what kind of sacrifices did your first guitar make to um, <laughs> your, your guitar tech journey, man? <laughs> um, pretty much everything you can imagine. Um, I, we spoke about it before the show. I, my first mod for that guitar was scalloping the fretboard, uh, similar to Ingve Malmsteen. Um, basically I tore this guitar completely apart. Like I completely took every part off of it. Um, I, I stripped the finish. I took the fretboard off just to see what was underneath the fretboard, like how it was put together, took the tuners off, refinished just everything. I mean, everything that I could think of, um, was pretty much what I did with that guitar. So was this the first, well, maybe, maybe the first instrument that you, that you stripped down, but I'm curious then when you were younger, did you do the same, do the same to some of your toys? I mean, this couldn't have been, this wasn't the first thing that you tore apart. I, I can, uh, I'm not, <laughs> if you say it was, I'm not believing it. Uh, it probably wasn't. It, it was probably the most like considered taking apart of something because like I had, I had kind of a goal in mind when I did all of this stuff, as opposed to when I was younger, I was probably just wrecking things left and right and not really thinking about it. But uh, with the guitar, like the big thing for me was I wanted to see how it was put together. And as I was taking it apart, I kind of like every step in like guitar building, it's a pretty logical step. Like there's nothing too mysterious about it. It all kind of goes together. And that's something that really interested me at the time and still does. And uh, I would say it was around like 17 when I really kind of decided that I wanted to build my own guitars in addition to just kind of, you know, taking them apart and modding them and repairing them. What was your, what was your next guitar, your next project? Um, I had a couple of other guitars. Um, I think when I was around 16, I had a BC Rich uh, Warlock, which was like pretty much an extension of everything I wanted in the guitar at that time. It was neck through, 24 frets, Floyd Rose, humbuckers. And uh, as I was getting into metal, that's kind of like everything that I wanted um, in a guitar. And actually, that's another guitar that, you know, I, I did a number of things to. I didn't refinish it, but... Um, like I definitely pulled the frets, tried to refret it. Um, I refretted that uh, poorly, <laughs> not, not good uh, because refretting uh, fret work on a guitar is probably the most difficult thing um, you can do apart from maybe refinishing or, you know, some maybe like resetting a neck on an acoustic guitar. These are all challenging, but refretting, is really difficult. Uh, fret leveling, um, fret work in general is just, I find it to be probably the most challenging thing. And so I, I did a number of like uh, refrets on that particular guitar, just trying to learn how to do it correctly. And um, I'm at the point now where I've done it like so many times where I can do it consistently and get good results, but that wasn't always the case. Like there's a, a steep learning curve with that, uh, with that particular job. So, 
And that's why most people just bring their <laughs> refred jobs to someone like you. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I wouldn't recommend like, I, unless you actually want to be doing this like actively and regularly, I wouldn't suggest, you know, just doing it yourself because it, it's not going to be better than what it was. It's going to be worse. <laughs> it's, it's just the nature of it. So. Yeah. From from the BC rich, you're, you're in your your metal phase, cool, which is which is funny. But my my best friend growing up, when we both started playing guitar at the age of 13, I'm pretty sure he was the same year. And his, I guess it was I can't remember now if it was his first. He had a hot pink BC rich warlock. Just yeah, I, yeah. I think those were uh, like 80s, like NJ. Uh, the NJ series of BC Rich. I think that's okay, what they yeah. it, it, it was used. We weren't, fortunately, we, we were into the 90s, but but not too far into the 90s, actually. And um, and of course, he, he uh, the, the hot pink got old pretty quick. So he just did a quick spray paint job, black, no primer. You can imagine how that looked after about a week. You know, let alone <laughs> yeah, like yeah. a few months. But it's, it's what you do when you're 13, 14, right? It's figure yeah. out. Yeah, there's definitely like now I'm not so sure I would have done what I did back then. But, you know, at the time you think like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll do this and it'll be fine. And it usually doesn't go fine. But, you know, it's part of the learning process. So. That's right. I mean, you got to learn somewhere and it's best on your own stuff, not someone else's. Yeah, definitely. Like you definitely have to do this on your own stuff. You can't be taking in other people's guitars to do this stuff with. Right. Right. Did you did you play any bands when you were in high school? Um, I played in my father's uh, blues bands, uh, the Eric Ross blues bands. Um, I we kind of played a, a few shows a year, um, kind of local festivals, uh, that type of thing. Um, but I wasn't really drawn to live performance. Um, I really kind of preferred, you know, just uh, either playing on my own, you know, and my own kind of music studio here or just kind of repairing guitars or, you know, doing that type of work with them. Um, you know, I, I certainly play every day, but it's, it's not really the live performance thing. Um, it, it's just not really for me, you know, like yeah. just kind of tearing down everything, going someplace, setting it up, playing, tearing down, bringing it back home, setting it back up. Like, to me, it seems like, you know, a lot of effort and, you know, oh, you I, I, just really... kind of, I just kind of want everything to be where it is and just, you know, plug in and play. Sure. Sure. You got to really want to do that. It's a oh, lot definitely. of work. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's for the love of playing, but it's still, it's still a lot of work. All right. So curious, you, you've, you're now driving age 16, 17, sounds like you're you know you're you're pretty you have intimate knowledge of guitars inside and out do you start doing some work for buddies um for some of your dad's friends or are you just still kind of tearing apart your own gear at this point um occasionally um i would take something in from somebody else if if it was simple and i felt that i could i could handle it like you know just kind of a, a setup or you know simple things like that but for a long time, probably longer than was necessary, but I pretty much did all of my own stuff um, just because, you know, I, I would accumulate guitars over time and all of them would need work because, you know, I didn't have $2,000 to drop on guitars. I maybe had 200. So that was kind of uh, really how I learned was just, you know, taking in guitars you know, buying them when I could and then either repairing them, modding them or um, also around 16 or 17. Um, I really got into building guitars and um, that was something that like around 17, I kind of made the decision that um, that was something that I wanted to do kind of for a living was build guitars. It kind of worked out differently um over time which we can get into as to why but uh yeah it was kind of building guitars repairing my own guitars modding them and that was kind of where i was at at that period of time what were 
some of the some of your early guitars that you built what were you into at that point um i would say like uh well i, I tried to make a like a uh Rhodes kind of flying v um randy Rhodes type of flying v yeah. a lot of the guitars that i tried to build were like they just were really the craftsmanship just wasn't there just because i I wasn't quite as good as I had hoped. And, you know, you just kind of have to struggle with it and learn lessons. Like, uh, I think repairing guitars definitely helped in building guitars because you kind of, you get a feel for, you know, kind of just figuring things out. Um, but building guitars, I, I would build kind of like super strats. Um, I would, I, I built a jazz bass. One thing that I, I did though, let's, I, I made a decision um, kind of in my early 20s that I would focus mostly on guitar repair and really seldomly build because building is actually quite expensive. Like, you know, the parts for a guitar, like if I wanted to build a guitar today, it would probably be about $900 in parts. And there's no real guarantee that the end results would justify the cost of that. And so I, I really placed a, a huge emphasis on guitar repair because I knew that that would be kind of the foundation of building. Sure. When, when, okay. Well, when did you decide to go? I mean, you said what 17 was really when you, you were pretty sure in your mind that you were going to do this for a living. When did you like say, no, this is it. This is what I'm going to do to start earning a living or generating an income. Or did you just grow into that as well? Was there, so an aha moment or was it just over time? It's like, Oh, guess what? I'm, I'm doing this for a living now. Um, it was definitely over time. Um, like this journey has really been like a, a long-term type of thing. Like, you know, when I was in my early twenties, um, you know, I, I went to college to learn, uh, kind of woodworking. Then after that, the next logical step was, um, uh, like getting a bachelor's degree in small business management, entrepreneurship. And all throughout this time, I was, you know, still kind of learning how to do guitar repair, learning about guitar building. And like, that was always kind of the emphasis with me. So it was always um, like the, the formal education was always um, geared towards like the eventual guitar repair business, guitar building business that um, I eventually started. And I started um, actually in, I believe, September of 2021. And so I knew it was going to be like a long term, a long term thing. And uh, eventually, like now I finally kind of arrived and, you know, learning about, you know, growing a business and, you know, taking on customers and marketing and all of that. So, yeah, there's, there's of all of those things that are beyond your technical expertise, right? Oh, definitely. And you're you're, you're yeah. doing you're doing this to earn an income and it, it, it's a game changer. All right. So it, what I'm curious, what have been some of your most interesting or fascinating or cool guitars that have come across your bench? Um, it's an interesting question. I would say uh, one of the cooler guitars that I bought um, was actually like a 1960s uh, Tysco guitar. Or it, it was a Kingston, actually. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's technically a Tysco. Um, I bought it from a luthier friend of mine for $75. And this guitar, it looked really cool. I actually have a picture of it on my Instagram. But uh, it needed absolutely everything in terms of guitar repair. Um, $75 was not a bargain because it needed <laughs> hundreds of dollars of work. Um just to get it, my basically my goal with it was to get it as best as it could possibly be. So that meant, you know, a refret, uh, changing the tuners, making a new nut, uh, new bridge, new electronics, just everything you could think of. And uh, the end results, like that guitar is, it's really cool. Like it's very unique. It looks unique, it sounded unique. And uh, that was probably, that one definitely comes to mind. This is probably the coolest guitar that I've worked on. Is it pretty playable now? 
Uh, yeah, definitely. It's like, it's not ever going to be playable like a Gibson or like a, a nice yeah. fender, but it's as best as it could possibly be. It's interesting. You, you say Kent. Now there's, there's mixed, I've seen mixed reactions on Kent's and I think there was, there was some good, some good Kent's some really bad Kent's and maybe some great Kent's, but a friend of mine, Frank Myers, who's been a guest on this podcast, um, wrote a book called the history of Japanese electric guitars. And in the podcast, I think he said it on, if not, I'm giving away his secret sauce, but I'm pretty sure we were, I was like, man, what's, what's the best one? He's like, Kent. And it may have been a specific model. I'd have to go back to the podcast and, and listen, but he, he was like, man, he's like, if you can find like a good Kent, he's like, they're awesome. Yeah. yeah. Some of those, uh, the Japanese guitars, like they were definitely interesting. Like they, they had their own kind of thing going, like, they weren't quite Fender, like they kind of, I felt like they kind of drew from Fender, but some of them were really off the wall and some of them were just like really just cool guitars, interesting, like. Oh yeah, they, they did a lot of cool, stuff. crazy headstocks, a lot of Samurai-esque headstocks, um, neat stuff, but, but um, and Japanese, the, the Japanese made, they're great craftspeople now, whether that, that didn't uh, make it into every single guitar, but of course are some of the best guitar builders now in the world. Um, yeah. or, or I would say that, and I would argue that with anyone. So if you want, you want, if you want to go there, we can go there. Anyone on, on YouTube in the comments section. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are phenomenal builders all over the world. And in the 1960s, in terms of electric guitars, like that was kind of like when electric guitars were really getting going, like, you know, fifties, obviously here in the States with Fender and Gibson, but uh, in the 60s, like the Japanese kind of got rolling with their electric guitars. And, you know, the early stuff, the craftsmanship just wasn't there because, you know, they had only been doing it for a few years. But over time, I mean, they really progressed and now they're as good as anybody. Yeah. Do you, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm switching gears because if you take me, if I go down the, the Japan rabbit hole, man, we might be there for a while. So I'm going to bail out really quick. Um, in, in thinking about Kent, the Kent being one of the really cool guitars that you've worked on, um, in terms of your collection and what's, you know, coming on, what's great about being a tech is that whether you're a professional or a hobbyist, you know, you can buy guitars that are busted up at a discount, put your time and some money into it and have a really great guitar, but it's a good way to, to be able to to try out a lot of different guitars, as long as you don't mind doing the work. And that goes, of course, that goes for anyone. If you're like me and that's, you'd rather let someone else do it, then, you know, you're stuck. Sure. <laughs> you can't, you don't get to sample as many guitars in, in that sense. Um, what are, what are some other good ones that, that you've owned um, that maybe you, you got as a, as a bargain because of they needed so much uh, work? Actually, let me, I, I'm thinking of one guitar specifically. Uh, if, let me see if, if I you can... need to hop up and grab one, or if you're just looking to to jog your brain, that's fine. Um, it was a Fender. It was a Fender Bullet Bass. I'm not sure if yeah. you're familiar. Um, they were made in like the 1980s. Um, kind of looks like a P bass with uh, kind of like a Mustang type of pickup, a uh, split coil. I think I bought that for like $50 or something. Somebody was just getting rid of it. Um, and, you know, it, it was basically trash. It was like missing a saddle, completely filthy. Um, somebody put on a replacement pick guard, uh, which didn't match the body. Uh, the pickup, it worked, but the cover was missing. And there was like, you know, metal shavings, like connected to the magnet and everything. Yeah. Just yeah. a real mess. Um, but I bought it for 50 bucks, um, did everything on it, uh, new nut, refret, uh, replaced all the hardware. I made my own pick guard. Um, I think I, I drew it in like AutoCAD or something and made like a template and cut it out. Also with a pickup, I designed a 3D printed pickup cover. Um, cool for this specific pickup because you couldn't find it anywhere else. You also couldn't find the pick guard, which is why I made my own. And uh, yeah, I put this thing back together and uh, you know, it's, 
it's pretty cool. It's I I actually eventually sold that one, but uh, okay, okay, yeah, that was uh, it was an interesting project. It's the type of thing where, you know, if uh, you know, for fifty to, even for fifty dollars, like this thing was such a mess that like <laughs> nobody other than somebody like me would, you know, be able to buy it and kind of get it back to where it was. And right. so uh, occasionally there are bargains like this, but usually I can look at a guitar, even just kind of pictures and kind of go through my head and how much it's going to cost to restore it. Um, usually with something like, a, let's say like a, a Tysco guitar um, or a Kent or a Kingston, usually those guitars, because you know they're from the 1960s, they need a considerable amount of work. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the guitar might be, you know, let's say $300. It might need $300 or more in work just to get it, you know, to a, a standard that's worth, you know, worth playing. So bargains, they're, they're definitely out there, but you kind of really have to know what you're looking at. Yeah. Bargains. And if you want a good challenge. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And I, I always do. I can't um, help myself. Um, did, so the the tech lineage, no, specifically no real formal training, just trial and error on your own, correct me if I'm wrong, and then growing, in, growing into that and then just working and working and working out. Is that correct? Um, it's partially correct. Um, yeah. I would say a lot of it was just practical application, you know, me doing things, making mistakes, trying to correct them. Um, also around, uh, the time that I really got going with this, um, like 2007 or so, this was kind of the emergence of online forums of like early YouTube. And so, you know, you could kind of connect with other people doing the same thing online. And so I remember like, uh, the old project guitar forum, like Strandberg guitars, who's now like you know, in the Sweetwater catalog, I remember when he was just getting going. And so it's, it's definitely interesting to kind of see how people have progressed. And uh, so it, it was, for me, it was kind of practical application. It was just scouring the internet, online forums, um, asking questions. And also there, there was a couple of local luthiers who would kind of, you know, if I had questions, or if I had a a problem with one of my guitars that I couldn't really overcome. I would take it to them and they were gracious enough to, you know, kind of show me either what I did wrong or kind of, you know, what needed to be done to get it repaired or playing right. So yeah. it's really, I'm very grateful for that help also. Yeah. But a lot of it was just kind of, you know, it was on my own. I, I had the ambition to do it. Yeah. And, and like you said, if you distill a guitar down to its, it's pieces. It's pretty linear in terms of the assembly. And there's not really a ton of complicated stuff going on. It's just doing it all well um, and making yeah. the repairs well or making the build great. But at the end of the day, it's not generally speaking, not overly complicated unless someone makes it complicated, which also happens. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as far as the woodworking is concerned, like the woodworking on the body, um, it's pretty straightforward as, as far as electric guitars are concerned. Um, yes. And that's the, what I was referencing. Excuse me. Yeah. It, the neck is where things get kind of tricky because you're dealing with, you know, you're dealing with radiuses of the fretboard and of the neck. Um, you're dealing with fret fretwork, which once again, you know, we spoke about earlier. Um, also, you know, things like scale length, um, so the neck is definitely diff like more difficult than the body and, you know, there's a learning curve with it, but it's not, it's not overwhelming. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not building a spaceship, it's building a guitar and it's, it's not that complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, talking about it, um, I know you've got one or two or one or whatever, maybe a, maybe a handful of guitars. Why don't we take a look at them and then let's uh, let's kind of kick off after that and, and talk pedals, man. All right, yeah, I have a, a couple here. Um, I'll show this one. Actually, let me let me audible. Yeah, go for it. 
I'll show this one first. Um, this is uh, actually, this is probably the first guitar that I ever learned on. Um, before I got the Behringer Strat, I probably got the Behringer like a year or six months into playing. Prior to that, I was actually playing this, and this is my father's guitar. It's a 1972 Gibson SG Deluxe. And these are not really well-regarded guitars, um, but this is actually a fantastic guitar. And my father's had this probably since 1972 or around there and has played it, you know, as really his main guitar for the past 50 years. And so this is just a great guitar. The, the, uh, the, the things that I like about it is the neck profile is consistent um, all the way up the neck, where a lot of SGs, they kind of flatten out up here, like they're thicker down at the nut and they flatten out. This has a nice consistent neck profile. Also, the body is considerably thicker than a lot of SGs. And so that means it balances really well. And it's just, it's a really nice old kind of vintage guitar at this point. And uh, yeah, I would not, not really too expensive. I think you can probably pick one of these up for between two and $3,000. And if you're in the market for an SG, like I would really consider giving one of these a look because they're really nice guitars. And it, that one was your dad's, man, which makes yeah. it all, all the more sweet, dude. Yeah, this is his. Um, he plays it, you know, still pretty regularly. Like, this is his pick right here. And it's it's a really nice guitar. Actually, uh, I'll show something of a similar era also. Sure. This is uh, his bass. I think yeah. he, I think the story is he bought this from somebody for like, I don't know, $25 and a six pack of beer back in, you know, 1969 or so. This is a, I think it's a 69 Gibson EB3. And this thing, once again, like this is an incredibly nice, nice bass. Short scale, um, has a really high output neck humbucker. The bridge humbucker, I think is probably the best sounding on this guitar. And, uh, yeah, it's just a really nice bass. So yeah, this is a it's a nice one. I'll, uh, I'll grab this one next. Uh, this is actually mine. Uh, this is a 2005 Gibson Les Paul Standard. Not a particularly sought after year or anything like that, but. Um, I actually got this guitar after uh, the BC Rich. Um, I kind of outgrew that guitar. And I was at a point kind of in 2017 where I was, you know, I, I was kind of looking for a guitar. I knew I wanted something new, something better than what I had. Wasn't really actively looking for a Les Paul, but I was at a, a friend of mine's house, a luthier friend. And, uh, you know, I was kind of mentioning that, you know, I was, wasn't really happy with what I was playing in the guitar shops and I wanted something new. And he kind of mentioned that, you know, hey, I have this Les Paul, um, you know, do you want to check it out? And I said, yeah, sure. And so, uh, you know, I, I plugged it in. He had a, like a black face fender, 60s, and uh, the phone rang and he went to go answer the phone. He was on the phone for maybe 10 minutes and I was just playing this thing and I knew like by the time he got back that this was going to be my next guitar. And so about a month later, bought it. Um, I bought it in April of 2017 and play it every day. It's actually considerably lighter than pretty much any Les Paul you would encounter. It's eight pounds, one ounce. And uh, it's just, it's perfect. It's really the one guitar that I play. I really don't play many other guitars besides this because it's just set up exactly how I want plays really nice sounds really nice and it's the one when you, when you find the one yeah there's no reason to look elsewhere there there is no reason man good for you you found that yeah. young <laughs> yeah 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 I I hope to have this for the rest of my life because it's just it's a great guitar it really is like 
Gibson's, um, if you find the right one, I mean, it's a lifelong type of guitar. And uh, there's a reason why, you know, so many good guitar players, you know, like Slash, for example, um, you know, they they have a, a Les Paul and they've just played it for decades. And, or really it goes for any Gibson or, or you know, a, a Fender also. But like, there's a reason, you know, people play these consistently and play them for years. And this is a good one. Yeah, you got yours, man. That's a good feeling. That doesn't always that doesn't always happen to everyone, man. You know that, right? Some people never find it. Well, some people are members of the Guitar of the Month Club, and so you know, every month they got to get a new one. But I'm uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's you know, I definitely understand the appeal. Like for me, I think part of the reason why I don't really own that many guitars is. You know, I I kind of see guitars come in all the time. Like one reason is, you know, that's a really nice guitar and I really enjoy playing it. The other is, you know, I I kind of see enough guitars regularly to where, you know, it, it kind of satisfies the need to go out and buy anything. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so if I didn't have the repair business, you know, I might be more inclined to go pick up a Strat or a Tele or, you know, whatever else. But also, another thing I, sh I should mention is um, I, I've known people who, you know, they have a guitar collection and it kind of gets out of control. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to be one of those people who have, you know, so much gear that you have to step over it to get from the living room to the kitchen. Like, I, I definitely know those people, but and they it, it's a different. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. But it's a different type of mentality. Sure. And I, I certainly understand where they're coming from though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk pedals, man, because that is a uh, kind of a, a relatively new thing. We'll say relatively new in the sense that you are now in business operating as a pedal builder in, in addition to, you know, servicing guitars. Um, so let's talk, let's talk about kind of your lineage into the pedal business um, or your lineage into pedals, I imagine it was kind of like your first guitar. You, somewhere in there, you started taking apart pedals, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I would say uh, kind of got into repairing them a little bit. Um, you know, I, I like people would just kind of, you know, they'd have guitars and they'd say like, hey, can you fix this pedal? And at the time I couldn't, I wasn't, wasn't really that into it, but then, um, you know, like around, I think it was 2016, um, guitar pedals, guitars, guitar amps, they're all kind of tangentially related. And so like, you know, I, I was kind of doing electronics work on guitars, like changing pots or changing capacitors. And so I kind of got into the pedal thing, um, just as kind of, you know, a, a little bit of an extension of the repair work. And I, I kind of just, you know, started doing it, um, making like just kind of small repairs, like changing a switch on a, on a DOD pedal or, or, uh, you know, just kind of getting a kit and kind of trying to assemble it. And, uh, that's really kind of how it started out. When, and, and now you're building. So when did you, when did you start building your own pedals? Um, I would say around that same time, uh, 2016 or so. I, I think I may have started before then. Um, I tried to build a, a fuzz face, but I tried to do it like point to point wiring and it didn't work and I couldn't figure it out. And I spent a really long time on it and it just, it wasn't happening. So I kind of shelved that for a while, but I would say 2016 was really when I got rolling with it. And okay. uh, yeah, I think I only bought one kit and then I th I'm pretty sure that I just kind of got into building like shortly thereafter. Um, just kind of simple circuits, like a fuzz face uh, range master, that type of thing. At a certain point, I just kind of realized that it would be cool if, in addition to guitar repair, I also had a product to go along with my service. 
And so that's really how it got started. Um, I just kind of jumped right into building them. And that's been a couple years now, right? So talk, talk about, you've got, you've got two pedals out and one came out last year and, and I don't want to steal your thunder. You've got one in the works right now. And so why don't, why don't you take us back to the first pedal, kind of the, the impetus for that first pedal, how, you know, and that process from mind to physical product. Sure. Um, well, I, I would say that in terms of my first guitar pedal release, it's actually uh, this one right here. It's called the Winter Storm. It's a three-in-one uh, boost, overdrive, and distortion pedal. And this was really kind of a natural progression of circuits that I had been working on initially. So like uh, my first kind of guitar pedal that I made was a just a simple one-knob boost and over time i figured like well i can add a, a volume control to this because that's simple to do and i can add a switch to change you know from clean to kind of a overdriven sound and then you know eventually i kind of worked with some tone stacks you know adding a bass and a treble control and uh eventually i kind of thought you know well i have clean boost i have overdrive i'll try and add distortion and eventually I kind of figured it out. And that was kind of how the winter storm came about. It was really just a, a natural progression of a lot of other builds that I was doing at the time. And uh, I spent, I think about two and a half years developing it um, wow. because I was, you know, it was my first pedal and that I was, you know, really kind of original for me. And uh, so, you know, I, I would make some progress, then I'd hit a dead end, then I'd shelve it, do something else. And so it was kind of fits and starts with it. But eventually I got it to the point where I was really happy with it. I knew it was exactly what I wanted. And uh, yeah, I, I released it, I believe, March of last year. And uh, yeah, that was my first one. So when, when, you, when you got it to the point that you were happy with it, and it was, you knew it was exactly what you wanted, as you just described. D did you shop around with your buddies? Like, Hey man, you know, check this out. Why don't you play it? Let me build. Can I, can I give you a demo pedal to try out? I mean, what was just a little bit on the business side, but a little bit of like affirmation from the outside world that, Hey man, you've got something here. What was there much back and forth on that? Or was it like, boom, I know this is great and I'm just going to build it. Uh, it was pretty much the latter. Um, it was exactly what I wanted. And I just kind of knew that, you know, I, I had been playing guitar for, let me think, uh, well, since 2007, I released it last year. So I was, you know, I've been playing guitar long enough to kind of know what I want to hear. And uh, yeah, it was really just kind of a, a personal type of thing. Like, I was pretty certain that it was exactly what I wanted. And, you know, if, if the public approved of it, which I thought that they would, then, you know, they would pick them up and they actually did. So, you know, and, you know the pedal business, there's a lot of pedal builders in the world, a lot of pedal, pedal builders in every state. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. A lot of pedal builders in one city fill in the blank with what it is. And so I know it's, it's a tough market and, and, a, and guys build pedals, guys and girls, um, because they love, they love what they do and they, they have found the pedal that's creating the tone or the sound that they're looking for just, just as you did. And so it's, it's a thing of passion it, uh, first and foremost, but it's also a crowded space. I mean, the lot, there's lots of spaces that are crowded. Pedals are crowded. Pickups are, are crowded. What, um, and, and not that you, that matters at all, but is, does, that I mean, is that in the back of your mind? And how do you cut through the clutter? And and how do you how do you promote your pedals? I know you're you're working on that, and it's that's the whole business side of being a guitar technician or a pedal builder. You love what you do, and you can be great at your craft, but you also have to market the product. Sure. Um, yeah, I think that the difference between somebody like me and somebody who's just you know a hobbyist is that this is a business for me, and so I've. I've basically made this product and, you know, I have spreadsheets of how much material costs go into it. I'm considering things that, 
you know, somebody who's just making a few pedals for people, you know, a year are probably not considering. Um, so I would say that that's definitely like, that's definitely a consideration as, as far as marketing is concerned. Um, I think, you know, you're correct that the, the space is definitely crowded, but I think that there's enough, uh, there's enough to go around. I'm not really concerned that, you know, somebody's going to buy some, something from somebody else and not from me because, sure. you know, for whatever reason, um, I think it's important, you know, obviously to market yourself effectively, um, across a variety of social media platforms, but also to, you know, just come up with a unique product and, you know, kind of explain and show why it's worth people's time and worth people's money. Um, I think a lot of guitar pedal builders, you know, they'll, they'll take something like a tube screamer or, you know, a Proco rat and just kind of add a switch to change the clipping diodes or something. And, you know, just kind of, they're a bit underwhelming to me. Uh, you know, it, it's fine that people do that and I don't have a problem with it. I don't begrudge anybody, but I, I feel it's important to really stand out and make something unique because, you know, if you're just cloning pedals, then, you know, why buy a, a Tube Screamer clone from me when you can get it from, you know, really anybody else? Yeah, but. yeah. The the name Winter Storm, was there any major inspiration for it? I like the name, man. Uh not really. Um, you know, obviously I'm, I'm in Binghamton, New York and it's wintry here. Yeah. It feels like more times than it's not, but, um, no, it, it was just kind of a, once again, kind of a natural progression. Um, I was kind of, at this point I was building pedals just kind of all in bare enclosures and just kind of very, you know, utilitarian to kind of keep costs down as I was kind of working through. Then I started kind of experimenting with, uh, you know, powder coated enclosures, knob choices. And I really liked the kind of, uh, well, I can show you, uh, the kind of cream colored enclosure, the cream colored knobs. Um, I really liked that aesthetic. And I have a thing for kind of monochromatic. Um, so like, you know, different shades of the same color. Right. And so that was that was like originally kind of what I had was just a color scheme. And then from there, um, it's tough naming things. It's tough naming products because so many of them are already taken. Uh, Winter Storm, it wasn't my first choice, but it just kind of fit the aesthetic of, of the pedal. So <laughs> yeah. I just kind of went with it, you know. <clears throat> you know, so Winter Storm came out March of last year. Yes. We're now on to, to pedal two. Spellbook. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this right here. Let's see if I can maybe focus. Yeah, that's got a killer cover. Yeah. Not sure if it's gonna focus, but you can right. check out my social media. It's littered with spellbook posts right at the moment <laughs> because I'm actively promoting it, but uh, David Ross musical instruments on Instagram and YouTube, of course, which I didn't yes. say at the beginning. Um, we'll, we'll also say that one more time. Hey man, we, you know what we talked about, um, trying to plug that thing and hope and hope that it sound good. Like it sounded good. We didn't check that before we hopped on. Is it, do you want to get crazy and try to just go for it? Or would you rather hold off? It, it's, um, it's your call. We want to do it justice. So I get if we're concerned, like, man, we plug it in, the audio comes through. <laughs> uh, I actually, I, I tried to uh, kind of do the audio here um, okay. where I'm set up, but there's so much room noise and like, you know, just clicking from the pick. I, I would say if, if anyone's interested, uh, check out my YouTube page or Instagram. I have a bunch of video clips on it, which uh, will definitely do it justice. Okay, um, cool, cool. All yeah. right, so sorry to deviate, I, but I just thought, man, we didn't do that. And if you wanted to, I wanted to give you the opportunity. Tell sure. us all about Spellbook. Tell me, where uh, did it come from? You give, you know, give us the nines on it, man. Sure. The Spellbook is pretty much a complete departure from the Winter Storm. Yeah. Uh, the Winter Storm, I wanted to be accessible to really any guitar player to kind of add as much or as little to their sounds as they like. Um, the Spellbook is, it's, 
it's its own thing. It's not like really any other pedal. Um, the inspiration for it was actually based on the old uh, Boss DM2 delay pedal, where if you turn everything up, it starts to self-oscillate. And th there are a couple of problems with it, though. It gets extremely loud, and also you can't, uh, play your guitar through it anymore. Like once it's self-oscillating. Yeah. So yeah. the thought in my mind was it would be cool if I could play my guitar through the oscillation. And that idea was really the basis for the spell book. Um, the spell book is a self-oscillating fuzz and distortion pedal uh, that can also be used as a standalone synthesizer if you decide you know, not to play your guitar, you can just kind of uh, control it with the content control, which uh, changes the pitch of the oscillation. So it's, um, I have YouTube videos and just videos and images covering all of this. It's it's a tough pedal to explain kind of in words. You have to hear it. Sure. Um, sure. It's, it's a very different guitar pedal. And uh, the response to it so far has been really, it's been overwhelming for me, honestly. Like, I, there have been like many times where I thought, like, this is either going to be a hit or it's going to fall flat, and there's not going to be any in between because it's so, it's just so different from anything else that you would encounter. Um, I, I'm actually quite surprised to how how receptive people have been to the idea. And you've got a Kickstarter campaign on that. For I that, do, right? yeah. Tell, tell us about that. Uh, well, the Kickstarter campaign, um, basically, uh, it's a way for people to kind of say, like actively say, I'm interested in this, I want one, and I'm willing to pay for it, as opposed to, you know, me just kind of making them like I did with the winter storm and hoping for the best. Um, it kind of gives people uh, the opportunity to definit definitively say that they want it. And also it gives me an idea of how many people want it. And so um, basically right now I'm in the funding period. Um, I did a bunch of marketing in the lead up to it. I'm currently in the funding period for it. Uh, once the funds are released um, to me, I'll order parts, I'll get them in, I'll build the pedals, ship them out to people. And that will be the entire kick, uh, Kickstarter campaign. So. It's uh, it's been quite positive so far. I'm, I'm quite pleased with how it's been. Like pleased enough where you're starting to get nervous about how many pedals you're going to build? Not at this point. Um, okay. I I did set a cap at fifty. Um, okay. I think currently I have about half of that in terms of backers. Sweet. So, uh, with the winter storm, I did kind of a similar run. Um, like even if even if I max out at fifty. I think I'll be able to handle it pretty easily. Like I, I can basically, I can basically build about 10 pedals in a day. Um, so, and, and possibly more. Um, I, I'm not really expecting, you know, I, I'm not expecting 50, but you know, as many as we get, um, I think it will be manageable. I'm really not concerned with that. Okay. And where, where on Kickstarter, people go to kickstarter.com to search David Ross musical instruments or what, where can people find it? We'll put a link in the show notes too. Uh, they can go to Kickstarter, um, type in Spellbook guitar pedal. Um, okay. They can also likely type in my name um, and find it. You can also go on my website in the shop page. Um, you can find the Spellbook guitar pedal and uh I have it so it's out of stock, but there's a link to the actual Kickstarter campaign, so you can find it there. You can also find it on my social media, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn. And so if anyone's interested, I, I tried to make it as easy to find as I possibly could. So That's awesome. What, when do you have, is there a time limit on the Kickstarter, Kickstarter campaign? When is it, when is that coming up? Um, actually, let me check. I think there's, uh, 17 days left. Okay. Uh, 16 days left actually. Um, and we've already met our goal, uh, by several folds. So, um, Sweet. it is, it is definitely happening 
people will be getting the spell book. So, so yeah, it's, uh, I, I estimate that it will probably be shipped in July and hopefully everyone will have their pedal by August 1st. Okay. All right. Good to know. Good to know. So time frame wise, that's awesome. That's coming up. So we're, we're, we are recording on April 26th for anyone that's referencing the 17 days the podcast will, will air a few days after. I, I don't know what day May 1st is. I don't know if that's coming up, you know, whatever, but it, close enough. You, you've got it. So we're looking at it towards the, the, uh, around May 10th, 12th, it ends. And of course you can find it on Kickstarter too, or from any of David's social media accounts. Yeah. And um, you'll also, I'll also, uh, once the Kickstarter campaign has ended, I also plan on offering it on my actual website. Sure, so sure. You can find right. it there. So, yeah. If you've, if you missed the Kickstarter campaign, which, that goes to help get get your product off the ground. You get a little bit of a break on the price of the pedal. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, I'm uh, currently selling them on Kickstarter for $150. Um, I also bundled the Winter Storm. Um, if you want both, uh, I offer a discount on both. Um, and then once the Kickstarter campaign is over, um, I'll sell it for $200 on my website, which is the same price as the Winter Storm normally is. Okay. So. Right. The Kickstarter is basically an opportunity for you to get it at a discount if you decide to, you know, back the projects. And uh, many people have so far, and so it's definitely happening. So that's awesome, man. What uh, are you are you thinking about pedal number three yet? Are you still? Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm thinking. I already have. Well, I haven't ordered the prototype PCB right. for number three, um, but number three is basically. It's basically done. Like I have, um, I have a prototype to build, and then I'll probably have to tweak it a little bit. Um, but I know pretty much exactly what I'm going to be offering for number three. Um, actually, I have a breadboard here. This is how I design circuits. Um, this is actually going to be number four. Um, so this is basically how it's all done. Uh, it's all individual components. Uh, kind of connected together on a breadboard, and uh, that's how I that's how I make pedals. That's how you have to do it. And so, uh, but yeah, to answer your question, uh, number three, I definitely know it's I know what it's going to be. Number four, I it still has work to be done, but I have an idea on that too. We were talking offline before we started that at this moment in your life, frequency maybe one a year. So you've, if you've already got number four in, you know, in, in your brain, um, could that frequency increase? And and then, so it's a two-part question. Then kind of, I don't know, let's project out three or four years from now. Do you have, do you have a vision of, of um, what, what the pedal world, what your pedal world may look like? Um, I would say uh, the frequency could increase. Um, I've like the number three pedal that I'm planning on releasing is called the summer heat which is a companion to the winter storm. It's kind of like the inverse of the winter storm with a lot of the same uh, types of design features to it. So I have, a, I have a good idea on that. I could technically release it this year because like it's, it's a lot farther along than I initially anticipated. Um, the problem is by the time I actually like end this Kickstarter campaign, um, I may be like releasing the summer heat in the middle of winter, which I, I'm not so sure about, you know, like it's kind of, I kind of feel like it's selling beach towels, you know, when hey, there's man, a foot of snow it, on the ground. But. but if it's a bad winter, we, we, everyone may love a little summer break, a summer thought. So that's true. Break. I'll have to think about it. Um, I may increase the frequency, um, depending on if I can get kind of everything together, um, I, I may, I, I'll consider, you know, releasing it this year if all things go, go seamlessly. Um, but yeah, uh, I would say increasing the frequency is a possibility. As far as uh, projecting three or four years out, um, really my goal with this business is to just kind of be self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. um, that's really kind of the goal that I had ever since, you know, I was 17 and I kind of got into the idea of owning my own business. The ultimate goal for me is really just to kind of make a living and do what I'm passionate about. And so um, three or four years down the line, I hope to be doing exactly what I'm doing, uh, 
you know, continuing to do guitar repair, uh, expanding the line of guitar pedals and, you know, we'll see what happens. Dude, that's awesome. I think that's a great spot to leave it, man. Follow your passion and uh, make a living doing it. And what, what, uh, there's not much better in life than that. Most definitely. Yeah. Man, that's awesome. David Ross, David Ross, musical instruments.com. David Ross, musical instruments on Instagram, Facebook, Utah, YouTube. Dude, thanks so much for your time, man. This has really been an absolute pl pleasure. Likewise. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. My, my pleasure, man. This is great. So we'll end that in there. David, I'll give you the, the last word, if you will. Did, did we leave anything, you know, off the table that uh, you really wanted me to ask you about and I didn't do it, didn't do it or anything you wanted to share? Um, I don't think so. I, at this point, I think we pretty much covered uh, everything that needed to be covered. So, yeah, you know, it was a I, great conversation. I thought about five minutes ago, we didn't we didn't get into your pedal board, uh, but we'll, that may be another podcast. So we'll hold that. But my bad for not bringing that up because <laughs> no problem. I actually have it behind me. It's uh, <laughs> I made it myself, and uh, yeah, it's got it's got a bunch of pedals on it from a variety of different makers, including myself. So that's awesome. And, and I'm sorry, we'll, 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 I'll get you to send me a picture of it. We'll, we'll add it here to the, to the end, man. Uh, this is great. Hang on with me, David, uh, for just a second as we, as we close out. And I just want to uh, one more time, thank our audience for their time. Uh, thank you much, so much, man. Time is your, your number one um, asset and to, to sit down and, and watch or listen to a podcast for 45 minutes to an hour means so much to me. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks so much, David. Hang on just a second. I'll talk, talk to you in a minute. Thanks for tuning in to the Guitar Gavel Podcast and a special thanks to Steve Kuykendall for composing this music and being such the great guy and friend that you are. As a reminder, hit the subscribe button and sign up for our twice-weekly newsletter at guitargavel.com.